Charles from Charles and Lord World. Checking in. Thank you guys for watching. We are getting into uh, uh, the destruction of black civilization um, by Tr Chancellor Williams. This is a really controversial book. It's on Audible. You want to go and check it out yourself. But we're going to we're gonna get into it. I'm going to play a little snippet of it and then we'll come back with my reaction. Go ahead and that thumbs up button, guys, and subscribe to Charles and Israel. Appreciate it. Far from it. For all these shouting, emotional outbursts by blacks are in themselves indications of weakness because they becloud the mind and prevent the calm and clear thinking that is absolutely required for planning if the race is to be saved from final destruction. Destruction is not too strong a term here. Only fools will be unable to see that the race is again being hemmed in, surrounded by its enemies, and cannot survive forever under what might be called a state of gradual siege. Those Negroes who are still pleading with the whites for brotherhood through integration are so deaf and blind that they are unable to get the white enemies reply to these frantic pleas for acceptance through integration. The reply of whites was so loud and clear that it was heard around the world. When segregation in schools and residencies was outlawed throughout the United States, whites fled from the cities to the suburbs just as though a plague had struck or some deadly disease was spreading. The blacks were left alone in the cities, now called ghettos or the inner city. This was rejection, total, complete. The black youth of America got this message from whites first, and they got it quickly. They formed new battle lines. Several millions of middle-class Negroes and their leaders have not received the message yet, and probably never will. For them, the white man is the ship, and all else is the sea. They themselves do not feel competent to develop the highest standards of life in the all-black communities created by the very whites they so much worship. For them, there can be no quality education unless, by hook or crook, some white faces, any kind of white faces, are in the classrooms. Their main drive is to force the fleeing whites to accept them, or, please, oh you superior people, allow us to bus some of our children to your schools. They achieve these hollow victories on the integration front. They add a new cry. Give us racial balance. These Negroes have neither the ethnic pride nor the self-respect that is so characteristic of American Indians, Japanese, and Chinese, and they seem utterly insensitive to being openly rejected by the whites and battle on with the fantastic idea that they can force the whites to accept them socially. One major reason why young black America understood the white position so quickly was that by some happy circumstance in history, they were more closely attuned to the great common people and therefore shared their common aspirations and common sense. No one has to tell them that there can be no bigger farce than the integration of hated and oppressed blacks with the very white enemies who oppress them. Both the farce of integration and the everlasting white enemy are regularly highlighted in the world's press. Race riots in integrated U.S. armies and Europe, and even at war in Indochina, race riots in camps in USA, race riots on the battleships of the integrated U.S. Navy, and in short, open combat between blacks and whites when they are forced together as equals. There is peace and harmony, of course, when the blacks humbly stay in their place, their subordinate place. Using the courts to force whites to accept blacks as equals is quite futile even when and if all the thousands of court battles are won. White America is overwhelmingly against integration, and white Americans are no different than other whites throughout the world. The only instance in their history when integration was welcomed was when the outcome would put them in a more dominating position, or one of personal security, money, and a prestige they could never otherwise achieve. Hence, because of the high premium many Negroes give to a white skin, the most ordinary whites will eagerly marry any black star or any other blacks if they have money. But in no period in history, and this point is important, have the masses of blacks sought integration and general amalgamation with the whites. During all of their travails, their pride in race was steadfast. The so-called self-hatred actually reflects a sense of futility and despair over lack of leadership and unity for action. They, the black masses, rejected general integration as a movement to obliterate the black race as such. The black masses still reject it. I have pointed out blind alleys into which we are being led by leaders whose aims and objectives are quite personal and not those of the black masses. 
The black masses should demand absolute equality on all fronts. Precisely the same rights, privileges, and responsibilities as all other citizens, and without any exceptions whatsoever. This obviously includes the right of every individual to attend the school or college of his choice, rent or buy a home wherever he pleases, marry whom he pleases, white or black, and to freely use all places of public accommodation, all of which is a far, far cry from the doctrine that all this must necessarily include a white presence to be valid, or a mass movement by the race toward amalgamation. The presence of whites in any given situation should be incidental, if considered at all. What the Negroes referred to above seem incapable of grasping is the difference between a good school and a white school, a good community in which to live, and a white community. To them, they are necessarily the same, continuing evidence of the Caucasian success in capturing the minds of blacks. The Motherland at the Crossroads The problem is essentially the same in our African homeland. There, too, white is still the standard of excellence, of what is right, wise, and best. I personally know a number of African presidents and ministers who will not dare to make important decisions without the guidance of white advisors, men who often know far less about the questions at hand than the presidents and their ministries. But they all feel the need for a white seal of approval. The blacks, therefore, still have a long way to go in order to achieve absolute equality as free men among free men. They have a long way to go in the United States and numerous other areas in which they live all over the world. In Africa, as of this writing, Tanzania leads in the first hard-headed, masses-oriented socio-economic program that is expressly designed to raise the level of life of the whole people, beginning with those lowest down. It is a truly African program drawing heavily on the African cultural traditions. It was, from its very inception, too much for those of the elite who think of independence as a mere transfer of power from a white ruling class to a black ruling upper class, leaving the masses no better off than they had been under colonialism. These are the kind of smug and cocksure leaders who are preparing the ground not for military coups, but mass uprisings such as Africa has not yet witnessed. The first line of action should center around the study and development of nationwide, people-involved, self-help cooperative programs, village by village, town by town, and block by block. Each community would do its own development planning, the government's principal role being to provide advisors, training, technical assistance, and loans when and where these are needed. For people with little or no money, barter and exchange are the first steps towards economic salvation, the basis for capital formation. Hit that thumbs up button, guys. Hit that thumbs up button. Increased food production should be seen as for both wealth and health. The main emphasis would be inter-community relations between the various language groups in all development programs. This means agreement plans for each area to specialize in producing goods needed, but not produced in the other regions. This is the direct route to national unity through cooperation in order to reach the goals desired in common by all language groups in each African state. Anyway, y'all, they get deep on this stuff, man. I mean, it gets really deep. Y'all need to check this book out. It is, I mean, and check it out now. This book is not just for black people. All races of people can listen to this book and learn something. This book is deep. I don't know who this dude Chandler Williamson is, Williams is, but he did his research and he gets really deep. Very interesting, man. If y'all want to listen to the whole thing, check it out on Audible. It's called Destruction of Black Civilization by Chandler Williams. Go ahead and check that out, guys. In the meantime, go ahead and do your comments. And, uh, subscribe to the Appreciate it.